No, that's okay. <laughs> that's just getting ready. So really, really pleased to have everybody here tonight. Thank you for joining us. We are so incredibly honored to have Matt Wadel visiting with us here at HOMA, um, doing the first part of a three-part artist residency. So here this week, really starting to understand the museum and a little bit more about Hawaii. Then he'll be back this summer for a month-long engagement, and then he'll be back early in the fall um, to do the third and final part of it. So we are incredibly honored to have him here. And uh, here uh, next to me also is Aaron Padilla, our Director of Learning and Engagement, who has been guiding um, our, Matt's artist residency and who has been here with the museum for many, many years doing phenomenal work. So we are so excited to have this conversation with you this evening. And I just wanted to begin by giving a little context about Matt's work. Um, and then Matt's going to speak to you, show you some slides, and then we're going to have a conversation and then invite you guys to ask any questions. So that's the format for this evening. So, you know, I would just start by saying that I first saw Matt's work about 10 years ago in Los Angeles, and I was really blown away by it. It was at a gallery called L.A. Louver um, that still works with Matt and supports him, an incredible gallery um, that also works with David Hockney. And I remember one of the first things I was told about Matt's work is, this is David Hockney's favorite artist. And I could see why, um, because the show that I first saw was you know, filled with works that are very typical of, of the work that Matt does, which is to say, extremely varied and incredibly impressive, monumental in scale, um, experimental in color and form, a dance between abstraction and figuration. Um, I just had never seen anything like it. And then shortly after that, I had the pleasure of meeting Matt himself, and I couldn't believe that such amazing work um, had such an incredibly kind and uh, incredibly philosophical, insightful, amazing person behind it. So it was both the, the work and then um, understanding Matt and his philosophy and his approach that really just drew me deeper and deeper into his practice. Um, and then by total chance, I was working in Ohio at a museum and um, although I had first seen Matt's work in Los Angeles, he was also living in Ohio on the other side of the state um, in a beautiful uh, piece of property that he shares with his wife and their two children in the most idyllic, beautiful, incredible life um, that Matt has woven for himself. And his studio there is incredible. His life with his family there is really magical. And um, I'm really excited for you guys to hear a little bit more about Matt and to understand more about his practice and philosophy and approach because um, he's one of the most inspiring artists that I've ever met. So having said that, I'll hand it over to you, Matt. No pressure. No pressure. Did I do that? Did that happen? Okay. Thank you for having me. I've never been to Hawaii before, so it's like coming from Southeast Ohio. It's just, it's always. I mean, I grew up. I spent a lot of time in LA, so like a lot of the root influence of my work is from some of the kind of ecosystems in Southern California, and I think living in s Southeast Ohio, it's kind of as if that ecosystem was given groundwater in many ways and that's shifted and changed in a lot of uh, varying directions so coming to a hawaii it's just like the, the 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 ecology here just is immediate influence in my work and i can't wait to bring that back to ohio um, in my practice um, so i have a show up at the toledo museum of art right now and that's where this piece is outside it's, it's like an earlier the scale is kind of like I'm, I like to stand up, sorry, because I move, my body moves. A lot of my work is about movement and kind of contending with like emotional states of thinking, emotional states of like inhabiting gesture. Um, so I think of, so this is a kiln that I use. Um, I think of this space as a space of experimentation a uh, space of experiment, of, of the mind, of material, mineral, chemistry, um, just an exploration of the earth. 
and, and how it transforms. Longing, what, ha what takes place amongst longing when you let go of it to see kind of what, what comes back. Um, yeah, there's thinking about scale and risk and uh, the allowance of the unknown to take place. Um, my, so I grew up in, in, as a, my father's a potter, and so I grew up watching him, you know, kind of give shape to formless material and was, I think, always averse to the rules that he had. He was a potter, so handles were one way. You know, if it wasn't one, this specific way, it was a bad object, you know, because that's the, in the production of the studio. So I never really felt like I had agency to make in his studio, but it was more like an observation and exploration of material and curiosity and the ritual of using objects that, 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 um, that were handmade. And that later on became like the foundation, an umbrella at which the, uh, I began uh, and reapproached ceramics uh, from was in the reference point of my own childhood as a, as a beginning point of making. And a lot of people talk about the influence of my dad on my work, but I think the majority of influence conceptually comes from my mom's side, this kind of like emotional kind of like clarity, this emotional uh, uh, knowledge of touch, the healing nature of touch is like rooted, the love of gardening, you know, and the nourishment is kind of connected to my mother's side. And then this kind of like material, love of material and, and clay and uh, uh, the malleability of clay rooted in my dad. Um, so I think coming into space, it's, I uh, don't want to have preconceptions when I come into spaces. Is this okay? Is this right? Um, so allowing objects to emerge in space, um, coming in, not wanting to impose myself on the work. So in a, coming into an empty space, an, images, an image emerges, and then the, the decision that's kind of that takes place is like whether or not you acknowledge that image or you, or not, you know? And I began to kind of build trust that those images are trying to communicate language to me that, that know more than I do, you know, that have something to teach me. So then that becomes a framework of articulation, which then immediately dictates the next object. It will inform an, a work that will ex explode, kind of grow in this space, which will dictate this gesture. So like in this case, it's kind of interesting where you know, this head emerges, which then, um, or I think, no, there's this figure here standing on a fruit bowl, and then its head kind of emerged in the space, and kind of trusting that as language, that as knowledge, you know. Um, this flowering tree structure was kind of growing over here, and then all of a sudden I was kind of becoming this faceted structure that I'd been working on for like four years had kind of come to resolve in the kind of flowering element was like offered to kind of like be let go of the faceted structure and exist on its own here. And then I saw this sheep on top of it. So it's just like, it's the idea of like, just like, okay, I'm sorry, but this is the next direction, you know, that's going to take place. And then this head then became the sheep's head on top. I think the early work that I did was, um, <clears throat> set the foundation of arguments that took place over the past 15 years. So they were basically my own idea of flower, my own idea of figure, and those began to be things that I began to argue with. The early works were like setting up conditions for color to take place in the kiln, um, putting color in any of the mark making was just the, the glaze bleeding in the kiln, like melting. That was the mark making language of my work for the longest time, rather than a paintbrush, uh, paint, stroke, paint stroke, paint brush mark. Um, and please ask questions too if I get, because you guys know me. Yeah, yeah. Know you me do this, then we're gonna ask questions. Okay, okay good. Um, so this, the, then the flower structure, which, which uh, started out as um, repetition and density, the holder of color, um, started to, after making tens of thousands of petals, you know, at first everyone's like, why, aren't you, why don't you make a mold 
of the pedal, you know? It'd be so much easier. But there was this resistance to that. There was something about making this gesture and the slowness of this gesture, the restraint of like, having restraint in practice as like a measure of time that was important to me. You know, as I started to work. But then after time, doing the seven, seven moves, you know, one, two, three, 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 you know, for 18 hours a day for five years, like my hands start to stop working, you know, that they couldn't do that anymore. And there was this pain that existed, you know, in, in this like um, longing to not have to hold that pain anymore right um, and so like there was this thing that happened where my hands I, was, I noticed like this inability to continue and also psychologically this structure which became kind of like uh, repetition I didn't it wasn't really about each gest each pedal wasn't really an intentional gesture or re-articulation of form like I, I just wanted and I craved like each gesture being a new gesture, a new argument with the previous self, you know, to take place. Um, so I think over time, slowly, uh, they started to get softer. Like my, my hands, I allowed my hands to be softer. I allowed each one, there was a joy in slowly breaking this repetition. It was still pedal. Um, the glaze was still fairly melting. You know, that was the color language. There was, there was some slow breaking of that, you know, where I was kind of adding and in introducing other colorations of the form where I would push the form in different ways that broke the logic of glaze movement. A lot of this earlier work was obsessed with, like, the glaze just dripping all the way to the bottom. You know, so I would elevate these forms and so that the glaze would drip off like suck underneath the form and then drip down and then I'd grind it off and I there for me it was like this the fascination with like how did this how could this object be exist you know it's the idea of this like large single fired object which was an argument with viola Frey's work you know because I was working in southern california of like not really wanting these seams to exist in the work as this like secondary relationship to the object and having the phenomena of like how, how this object could possibly be constructed as this negotiation with the viewer. So there was this kind of, I was adamant of having these like single fired objects and the idea that one person kind of could navigate that through space. But those, those parameters, those rules, those strict rules over the past 10 years have been something that I've slowly dismantled and abstracted and argued with. Um, so the, the faceted structure, being let go of at a certain point, like feeling like it was resolved, and then re-emerging as a plinth, you know, re-emerging in ways that was still faceted, still angular, still kind of geometric, but now, rather than an object that kind of this emerged out of the kiln, was now kind of more obviously like a plinth, like, like a human-made object considering landscape, like landscape in the context of culture. Um, the, uh, and in this case, you know, the color starting to break away from just not, just these, this melting, like wanting, starting having agency and pushing the form and pulling the form with color. And them starting to kind of embody this kind of like, um, atmospheric kind of current space or the idea of like this bruising this idea of like taking color that I can push a form in with it so there you have this formal exploration and for me there's that's the majority of a ceramicist work or for my work it was all dealing with grayscale for 90% of the work and then you put it into the kiln and like the last moment was with color but that was forever what the viewer saw was that last moment. So there was this whole world of engagement that the viewer never participated in, you know. And I was always kind of curious about that disconnect of knowledge of like what the work was uh, taking place. 
But I think so, in a lot of this work, I started to get, notice these, this idea of like pushing in a form or contracting a form, undermining the form. And so there was this kind of this language, intuitive language started to emerge. I think for me, it was, now I see it as this kind of like language of trauma, this kind of like, this weight in one's gut, you know, this being, this feeling, this sinking feeling um, of like, yeah, there's this something in the gut of like being pushed here, unsettledness taking place, and manifested in form. Um, wanting conditions where intuitive language could take place. So the faceted structures were just really rudimentary, in a, like, what is that word? Rudimentary? It's in its simplest nature, like into a place of intuitive planes that could grow until they didn't need to anymore and come back and then, and then grow and merge. Like I could allow this object to just grow as it needed. There was this knowledge. It knew where it was going, right? So I think that started to emerge in different ways in which the, these tendrils, these kind of serpentine cylinder structures, started to grow and inter, intertwine. These, this rhizome element became this intuitive space that would, there would be this knowing that you would just trust. Um, okay, and in this case, that petal, <clears throat> there was this one object where this longing for gesture making to take place that that I had to, in order to break out of the sequence, this kind of restraint, this restriction, this, this imprisonment of, of sequence, and there was just this one point in an object where I just was like, you know, with this piece of clay, and that was enough, you know, and it was this radical transformation of my ability to step forward into a new way of thinking of, of like memory, the declaration of moving <clears throat> forward. Those then started to kind of like, what is this material now outside of this pedal structure? And then I started kind of squeezing them, you know, rolling, rolling them out. A lot of this work was kind of like really physical in terms of like rolling out this like 11 foot coil and then scooping it up, you know. Like it became that kind of gesture. So there's like, it became more about this accumulation of material, self in space, navigating body. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then in this state of like gesture, body exploration, body exploration, right? Rather than landscape exploration, flower, my own idea of flower my own idea of landscape, my own idea of figure, <clears throat> it became my own idea, my own awareness of my own body, right? <clears throat> um, so the landscape started to become more abstracted. I haven't shown much figurative work, but at the same time, my figurative work started to become more abstracted as well. Figures becoming landscape, landscape becoming figure. Um, I think it was around this time when there was this thing that happened in South America. It was like uh, where these kids were being born with small heads, right? And um, well, what happened is I had this, received this, I do everything my, on my own. Uh, I've become acclimated to make, making work on my own, partially because it's hard enough to deal with works exploding. It's hard enough to deal with other people dealing with works exploding, you know? It's, so it's nice to just like not have to deal with other people. And I've just become acclimated to learning how to navigate objects through space, moving these like uh, 3,000 pound eggshells through space into the kiln and then the knowledge that it takes for that object to be constructed. Um, and in that space, like I had oh, received this intense concussion where this object fell in the back of my head. And I had to like, it was, 
it was very disruptive to my sense of space. Uh, I was slowed down for a long, I had to relearn how to chop vegetables and like relearn some motor function stuff. And so I was kind of grappling with this inherent like dismantling of object from representation of these flowers becoming abstracted with, with my own kind of consciousness starting to also feel unraveling, you know? So like this work was unraveling, my consciousness was unraveling. Um, the grounds, like the foundation of my life just didn't seem like sturdy, you know? We were, um, we had kind of lost these two, uh, we had these two, three miscarriages at this time. And so like the moment I felt like I had something, it was taken away, you know? And then you'd like, and then you would, be making experimentations and longing to move forward in one's work and then <laughs> blowing up in the kiln, you know? So there was this simultaneous like chaos of like longing to grow and then it just, and learning to let go of that, you know? And, and so much of, a lot of the ceramic and clay work is like this just um, intense environment of, of learning uh, and growing as an individual and, and uh, trying to withstand the kind of trauma of this exploration, becoming like acclimated to that, especially at a large scale. When things blow up at that scale, it has a violence to it that you're, you have to contend with. Um, so, yeah, so work abstracting, consciousness abstracting, self abstracting body becoming the delineations between what self was and ecology was abstracting. And he's becoming these kind of like organ structures or heart. Feeling like this kind of, the works were kind of like burdened by their own color or like weighted down by their own color, the atmosphere of their environment kind of burdened by that atmosphere, this concern of like ecological collapse. Yeah, this ecology collapsing, psychology collapsing, right? Ah. <laughs> that was like the root of um, exploration for the past, has been for the past, I think, uh, tw 12 years or so. But at the same time, there's this deliciousness and celebration of material, you know, it's, it's like a delicatessen in a way of this thing you'd want to eat, you know? But there's this kind of like underlying notion that it might, that it might not be good for you, you know? And, and with, with clay, like you, when you mix like glaze, you're like, it's like delicious. You know, you have these moments of longing to drink it. You know, it's a strange relationship to a material that's like, it looks like a smoothie, you know? Oh, a delicious smoothie too, you know, pink smoothie. And you, you have this like cup and you're like, you have this taste experience, right, to it. Or you, you grab clay and it's just, there's a, a visceral, emotional palate experience. So for me, finding material as in exploration as kind of this point of delight, yeah, that kind of contradicted the traumas and instability of kind of psychologically of the things that I was navigating. And so I think I really found and I've always found clay as this point of comfort, both to my past as this like time travel device in a way of like formally uh, connecting to my childhood, connecting much further than that back, but also just this allowance that I could uh, explore in this kind of, with a material that created a sense of delight. Um, <clears throat> this was my first attempt at bringing ornament to a pedestal. And it was just like, it was very rudimentary, like, it's like had legs to it. And it was also like a technical device of like allowing like a formal element uh, of like being elevated like that to just have, be able to lift, pick it from the bottom and not have to worry about rigging this crazy fragile object, you know? And so I was like, why can't I just like pick it from the bottom and then create this space where I could have all this fragile mass take place on top of it and not worry about how to rig it. Um, and the suspense of like formally of like, why, why isn't that 
ripping itself apart, you know? Why isn't that splitting? So for me, I think as a ceramicist, as like a person who loves material and understands and is, explores ceramic material, there's, there's moments of confusion of like how this object um, could possibly be rendered. Solid coils, you know, 200 pound coils that are in this strange attempt of like climbing a ladder, you know, by myself at two in the morning with this urgency of negotiation, negotiating self and consciousness and space. <clears throat> Thinking about, for, for a while these things seemed like fragments of architecture, in a way like a finial structure. Um, I was kind of curious if like, uh, if they're fragments of architecture, like what would happen if that whole architectural structure was created? Like, could I create this whole, is it a cathedral? Is it, is it a castle? Is it a, um, what is that? If they're fragments, what of? You know, that was a question for a while. I think any more they're fragments of consciousness, right? They're fragments of my own consciousness. And, and that being not the architecture, not being a cathedral, but it being, yeah, uh, the mind. Mind as this kind of cathedral, right? Um, playing with, finding how, like, there was this installation that I had uh, that I was working on, and then the installation date got pushed back a year. And I had this decision of, like uh, the the urgency was removed, you know, and I was pushing the forms forward, and then all of a sudden I was able to ask the forms what they wanted, you know, not what I was pushing on them from any restraints, and it was just this gift that I think that took place where the 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 architecture, the form started to jut up and go over, become they started to grow into this space that contained. Um, this organic masses that we're growing amongst. I also had this dream in this, this point where like I, I was stuck in a kiln. When I was in grad school, some kid shut the kiln on me. And it was terrifying. Um, and it was like a latch kiln. <clears throat> and, then, and like sometimes in grad school, I would like pull the work out at 300 degrees and like reglaze it. So I'd be in this like 300 degree kiln, glazing frantically, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I had this dream where I was in this kiln and the, the fire was on and um, it was this idea of like the only way out was through the flue, but like the flue is only this big, so it's, it's like a, it's the it's impossible way out, but the, the spirit, this kind of longing, the only way out is there, right? Like the cat, but, but it, it's smaller and it went out the burner port, which is really nice, yeah. That was a lot, you know, yeah. I accidentally, my cat got stuck in my kiln once and it survived, but it had to go. The only way out was through the fire. <laughs> and, it, and it went through the fire, yeah. Kind of singed its. Yeah, I wasn't going to bring that up. Sorry. <laughs> but there was this idea of like, there was this idea of like, burrow, there's this mass that's kind of like burrowing into this space, right? Um, trying to move, navigate forward, but unable to, restrained, right? Um, so I think for as a sculptor, as a ceramicist, as a son of a potter, like that's, that was the framework of my thinking a lot of times. And so I've slowly, as I started to navigate the fact that I was mark, making marks, it wasn't just the subject matter, it wasn't just the material, but it was also the material of my mind. Um, I started to kind of think about um, the the difference between painting and drawing, printmaking, sculpting, uh, uh, performance, um, ceramic, uh, cer being a ceramicist. It all started to kind of collapse, and I started to kind of see. So with these pieces, it 
the, the architecture became a vertical wall that then I could uh, compose an image on. And once you have this structural wall, then you can draw. It's like it has a speed of drawing. You don't have to worry about the slowness of drawing, right? With clay, it has to, you can do like six inches and then you let it dry. And then three inches and let it dry. Three inches and let it dry. It's just a slow progression. But in this case, I was able to just draw in space. It was, it was relieved from that burden of, of uh, time. So these two series of like thinking about like a spellier structures, allowing myself to kind of go back to this earlier pedal structure to play with uh, this arrangement on a wall, wanting the glaze to stop moving. That's really frustrating, you know, as a painter when every time you make a mark it bleeds, you know. So thinking about ways to try to find material that stayed put. And so in this case, like just painting raw pigment on top of the glaze. It's like a wash. That led to like trying to kind of further realizing that maybe glaze wasn't the right material. And so thinking about using porcelain and adding pigment to it um, and firing it to a high temperature and becoming vitreous, like glass-like. And then that becomes kind of like, uh, it becomes like sculpting with oil paint because it has this kind of glaceous coloration and thinking about further kind of breaking down this idea of sculpting and painting with color and having these dreams of big bats of yellow, right? 300 pounds of yellow, 300 pounds of blue, so like big piles of like Play-Doh that I could explore. Um, and so in this case, thinking about figure, these being reduced to kind of planes, then that becoming material to just squish, you know? This material, I was like, I was, I was uh, mixing it to the consistency of like cream cheese. And so like, oh, that's, if you've ever squished cream cheese, right? Let alone red or green or blue or white cream cheese, you know? That's a really wonderful experience. I really recommend that. And, and then, so you'd have this pile of, oh, and then, so it then became more about this action, you know? in like color, adding color, and then exploration of material, matter, material, and then a different way of glazing, a different way of color working. Still this kind of obliteration of a form, but from a different perspective. So these ones are, oh, these porcelain series, and these are really cool, because then you, porcelain's frustrating because it shrinks so much that you have to dry it over a really long period of time. So these, you, they dried for like eight months or so, and so they wouldn't crack. Then that becomes like, what is this? Why, like, what is this action, this kind of exploration of color? What happens if it's independent of the landscape, you know? Then it became about um, just this pure state of abstraction, working with color independent of that. Then what happens, right? So there's this whole series during the pandemic of like um, allowing states of color to take place, color exploration to take place, um, and noticing that I would see images in that color. I would see images would start to emerge, right? And then why do we kind of evolutionarily see images in things? Like, yeah, it's, I mean, why? in a state of fear, in the dark, looking into a tree, are you comforted by an image that you've seen that might contextualize your surrounding or give you strength? What is the, like, why do we do that, you know? And thinking about that as this kind of like origin of mythology in which, uh, in storytelling and gods, and, you know, that's the origin of a lot of those images. Um, So finding comfort and allowing myself space to see images, still, it's, that's been a reoccurring thing. But rather than, there's a different relationship to the images seen recently. So this is creating conditions, in this case, for images to emerge. Um, so with this series, which was the most kind of recent series, I found myself just sitting in the studio, 
in being kind of in a state of mourning. And I wasn't really looking at the work, but I was sitting next to these objects, you know, maybe my hand on the ear, just thinking. Because, like, the fingerprint became present in my work. I was always reluctant to have fingerprints in my work, you know, because I always grew up in the framework of Volkus, you know, and this kind of, like, you know, you know. And I'd like this, like, reluctance to kind of fall into the kind of machismo, like, kind of, like, framework that that work was it. That I, that I argued, my vulnerability argued with. I didn't want that. But I think I've, I started finding those prints in mark making slowly being rendered because it was more memory of exploration. So I found myself kind of with my hand thinking, working through this kind of fear, state of fear, state of mourning, this during the pandemic of things just feeling like they were... Um, very close, you know, time was very close, not sure what was, that it was going to exist, you know, things, yeah, time shrank, it seemed like. Um, and I remember listening to this video, Nick Cave had this like Art 21 video or something, and he said, like, the moment I realized I had, I was conscious, everything changed, and I was like, what is that? I was like, God, you know, it's just like, well, okay, how do you shed, like, this framework. How do you kind of step into possibility, this reawareness of where this new state, a new state of thing, a new state of possibility? So I stepped back and I started looking at these heads, and immediately, like I, they like grew these long bodies onto them, and so they were the, there was these six heads that were stacked in my studio, and so I just kind of. I saw the bodies, and so I just measured them, you know, like this one ended here. So I took all the measurements and started to kind of sculpt these, uh, these bench forms that the body, these heads could fit on to as a place to sit, you know, because that's what I was doing. I was sitting next to this head in this state of um, kind of mourning. So this is a series is called Mourning Bench Series. Um, and these are important because I think... <clears throat> Like uh, thinking about what the what the function of mark making can be. Um, after I had built this, the bases, the the benches, I found myself like sitting in the end, the the end point, you know, and with my hands on the form, um, and felt me like needing to kind of recognize this work that I was doing emotionally, trying to step forward, kind of an acknowledgement of this state of mourning, you know. And so like the gesture making, the, how I was holding the form, that was the kind, that acknowledgement as mark making, as this, the kind of function of that gesture making, as this idea of growth, stepping forward, this kind of belly, structure, the kind of mourning that was held within that um, tender, fragile space, you know, um, as like clues to f in areas of, of, of work, you know, like this work that collectively we're doing as a society, right, in our studio, in, in this practice of, of, in this, in our pursuit Um, the kind of knee, body, uh, finding clues. And this one over here with this arch structure, um, there's intention, but then uh, this cylinder structure I built too quick and it collapsed, you know, and it left this big hole in the form. You know, so do you like it? I see those as offerings, you know? It's asking you, are you sure, you know? Are you sure this is correct? You know, are you sure you're going in the right direction? And usually what happens is like something else reemerges in that space that knows more than I do, you know? That teaches me something. And then it became this different kind of arch structure. The, the head didn't make sense anymore, and that was removed, and it became a different, a different space where you could like lay down, sit, you know, like navigate almost as a child could like 
kind of navigate these different states of this object um, and touch, you know, the memory of touch and exploration, the memory of, of pursuit. Um, so with the, I was in the state of kind of dismantling, more like kind of thinking about the images within consciousness, and not projecting images, but the images seen in this kind of duty to kind of uh, render them, regardless of self, regardless of aesthetics. <clears throat> And it was difficult, you know, because these objects would emerge that, that were hard to navigate. They were kind of these demon structures. They, were, they had horned. They were kind of grotesque. Um, and then the curator at the Toledo Museum created this offering. She had, she, she had uh, Diane Wright had mentioned this idea of, like, she was playing with the idea of mourning, of, like, to mourn and then mourning as, like, this... This re, re, uh, to stepping into this, this re-emergence of self, you know, and playing with that, the language there. And that, like, one curatorial gesture, you know, she gave me this, like, gift as a sculptor where it was, like, she gave me this, like, offering to heal, you know? Like, that that's a state, that's a legitimate state, you know, that I could, this conceptual space to kind of, like, um, to, to heal. So I, I found myself kind of curious after spending years telling myself that this flower structure was this conceptual uh, um, imprisonment in a way, this restriction, restrained space. I was kind of curious if that, if I was just kind of, if that, if I was just telling myself stories, if there was anything to that story that I'd been telling myself in, in this linear narrative of how my work he turned, it dealt with abstraction and realize that it like, I don't see my work as linear anymore. It's kind of this idea that splinters, that splinters, that splinters, right? And all of these points are still active, right? That I can engage with. So I started working with these flower structures again. And I was like immediately kind of uh, taken back to the kind of the core just relevance of that earlier work, this kind of celebration, that celebration, this healing as like, uh, like, which is like, as the argument, you know, this advocacy for, of like craft or fallibility as human, as this, um, this healing device, craft, language, knowledge as healing, love, compassion as the state of healing, as the relevant conversation to kind of participate in. Um, the pedal structures became this state of meditation in a way. During the pandemic, we, I became like full-time homeschool parent and we still do that. And so like the, the pedal structure became this like state of meditation where like I can, uh, work through rather than each gesture needing to be this kind of radical transformation step forward, right? I could be doing that work, that difficult work within this meditative state of this flower structure and kind of be thinking about my loved ones, the work that I longed to do but didn't accomplish in the day, you know? So I found myself like doing this good work, you know, that I could heal from and recognize to then bring into my, to the loved ones in my home, my community, you know, is this kind of state of remembrance of the work that I needed to do outside of my studio. Um, so like, so the, what once became this like restraint turned into this uh, state of healing. And then also they become these beautiful holders of color and exploration of mineral and material that you could uh, create conditions for to, to melt. And, um, all right. Yeah. There's a lot in the way color takes place, but I, I should take a pause. If you have, if you have. Okay. All right, sorry. So, okay. No, no, no. So this is Matt. Right, so um, I actually spent some time with him a week ago in his studio. 
um, spent some time at Toledo looking at the exhibition. And prior to that, we've had a number of conversations on the phone. And um, in the last week, he's been here and we've been having a lot of conversations. And, and one of the things that I noticed, I'm going to share this, you know, it's like, I don't know if you've ever been around like freestyle rappers um, and they get into the flow and they start just, the poetry comes out and you just, okay, just let it out. And um, so the conversation, you know, ask, I ask him a question and it's like, okay, it's going to come and here it goes. So it's been, you know, and all of those conversations um, in reflecting at the end of each day um, brings me back to all the conversations that I've had about clay with myself and with um, my peers over the 35 years of my on and off history with the material. And so thank you for that because that was a really, that was a gift to me um, revisiting those conversations. Um, the other thing that I want to say about Matt is um, I've been thinking about like, okay, who's Matt like? And um, and I know some of you folks in the audience might have were there about 25 years ago, and we had the opportunity where Stephen the Stabler came to Honolulu and worked with us in the ceramics community. And um, in my reflections, thinking about even just right now, it re it dawned on me um, this is the first time an artist has. Um, embraced process um, fully, uh, but in the difference this time around, it's with intentious, uh, intention and consciousness. So um, you like the next Stephen the Stabler. I'm just going to say that out loud, from, in my opinion. So, um, so question. Um, we've been talking a lot. I think our first conversation that we had, uh, you asked about our studio, um, talking about the opportunity to come to Hawaii um, I had known that you worked on a large scale, and um, and you asked, "How big is your kiln?" And we're like, "It's small." Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we started having this conversation about parameters, mm -hmm. and um, which was a fascinating conversation because I I've always believed in in great art comes from within a box, mm -hmm. right? The conversation or the the statement that artists, great artists, think outside the box. It's like that's not. In my opinion, that's not true. It's, there's always a box. The artist finds the solution within the box that nobody has ever found. Um, and without parameter, that unattainable, hidden, secret solution um, is, is something that, you know, I don't know. So like, can you talk about the parameters that you set um, and, and what that means in terms of, yeah. of yeah. Just the, the initial yeah. idea of the kiln size was like just wanting space for the body to exist, you know, to just be able to like do this. Like that was this, the way in which ideas took place in my emotional state, right? And so that was kind of the space in which my kiln um, took place, but then, and a lot of my works about argument, you know, of of finding why am I continuing in this framework? What happens if I shift this? You know, why is this the most clear representation of image at this scale rendered? Right? Um, can I make? Can I work in this state? You know, and then being kind of like oh, finding the state of like relief that I don't have to be burdened by the weight of this object. You know. Uh, one of the gifts that my daughter gave me over the pandemic was like asking me to make a doll, right? While I'm doing my serious work, you know, and being like, ah, like having to contend with like, no, but I'm the serious artist, you know? And then being like, I would love to make a doll for you, you know? <laughs> and then reframe and start working, grab the clay and start, and then all of a sudden, you know, that question, that intervention, you know, being like, like the most relevant thing, you know, like, oh my God, you know, like this is where, this is way more clear of an object than I was trying to do here, right? And, and having, using that as this point of part of being like, like this gift, she gave me a gift, right? To take, take me out of this framework, right? And so I constantly look for these clues in, around me that teach me more than I know, right? Um, this object is like small, it's, you can hold it, you know, share it, give it, you know, 
And then, so I would make this like little doll and then she would kind of see images within it. And then it would kind of, it would be this collaborative nature to it. So a lot of these like moments reframe my sense of scale um, and uh, trying to put my own mind in different states of consciousness and exploration of material, whether it be through painting or stone carving or, or uh, photography or um, different kinds of rendering, different material rendering. I don't think ceramics is a singular thing, like working with porcelain. It's a very different material than terracotta and maiolica. You know, it's just a different, it's a different technology, you know. Um, it's a different exploration of technology, different heat, different state of material. Um, it's not just, it's not a singular experience, right? Um, I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit more about this work that you've been doing with your kids, with Eleanor and Abner, because they'll be coming back with right. you later right. this summer. And I feel like that, as you've just talked about here, has become a really important part of your practice. And you don't sort of think about it as the time that you stop to pay attention to your kids for a while. And then you go back to your serious right. work. No, it's like, yeah. it sounds like from talking to you, like in the pandemic, those worlds have totally like melded together and, right. and merged into something. And I, I just was hoping you could talk a little more about that. Right. I think, so my wife got a full-time job at the same time. Like we used to have this beautiful, like we'd split half and half, you know. Well, at first it was really disproportionate where like I was teaching and working and, 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 and I was, she, in terms of when my kids were younger, she was taking more of that responsibility. And that didn't work. <laughs> that was imbalanced, right? And so then we split it evenly down the line, you know. And then it was like this, she had her practice I had my practice and we flip-flopped. And then when she got a job, it became like this reverse where like I, I took that full kind of project on. Um, and I remember my, there was this point in the, the, where I was like cleaning the floor or something and I was on my knees and I was just like, you know, frustrated that I wasn't in the studio, you know, and I was like cleaning. And then I realized like, like this state, like, I realized that I was doing all of this work emotionally, that I was growing, I was navigating conceptual frameworks, I was engaging history, self, consciousness, and this was just a stand-in, you know, this act of kind of cleaning the floor was just a stand-in, just like the way I was doing pedals, right? And this idea of this boundaries between my studio collapsed in that moment, realizing that like, the kind of like this caretaking, this act of caretaking was this kind of like universal framework that permeated my practice as a person and that it didn't just exist in the studio. And then all of a sudden it became about my community, about, about just presence, breathing, celebration, like just permeated through um, how I frame the work we're doing together in a space, right? Um, and so, yeah, we, we homeschool, and that becomes this idea of, like, in a way, it's kind of like grad school for kit for nine-year-olds, which is kind of insane. But, it's, uh, but they have their studio and their work. We, help, we each have our own exploration. And we, and, and we come together and te each teach each other, you know, for me to kind of have restraint or to kind of, like, it seems the most radical art gesture possible, you know, any, in the most, in many times, you know. It seems the most relevant conceptual framework. Sometimes it was like thinking that in the context of kind of an environment and the kind of ecological fragility, the most radical art gesture would just be to stop, you know. Like that would be the most relevant decision, you know. And so like it kind of gave you know, um, and so, so the idea of like working, choosing to um, put my energy, you know, to them, it's just like, wow, it's, it's, it's just radical. It's just so exciting. And, and, and the same thing that I'm doing in my studio, and it's been kind of one of the biggest gifts that I've kind of received in a long time. Can you um, share the Minecraft thing with everybody? Um, I might have a picture of, I don't have the exact picture of, um, okay. So like, I mean, geez, you know, just like look at her face. It's like, dad, 
like there's like clay everywhere, like under our feet, you know, just the kind of curiosity that takes place of just like, wow, like what is this material? Um, my, my son got like, they got into Minecraft for the pandemic. And so like, you know, they're digging blocks, you know, block layer and then the stone layer and, you know, and I was like, God, let's, let's go outside and get a shovel. We're going to dig some stone. We're going to dig the soil layer and see what that is. So we started digging the soil layer in this perfect little cube like they would do in Minecraft. You know, like how do we use Minecraft as a learning device to then implement into the real world? You know, it's a building. It's beautiful. It's architecture. It's, it's amazing. Uh, they're dealing with like ecological systems. They're, they have like uh, economic systems and stuff that they establish in there. So like how do we use that as this tr like area of exploration and then see how that is applied to the real world. So we were digging the uh, soil block out and then um, really pretty, you know, there's the question of like, what is this? You know, you grab the material and you're exploring it and just exploring the kind of earth beneath us. And then like, what, what happens if we fire it? What happens? And what, we, what if we fire in these different temperatures? And it became this way of like uh, exploring place and material. The story is a lot longer in terms of the, um, you know, one of the things I do in my clay is when I mix clay, I, I, grab, I grab it to tell its like consistency, if it's hard, if it's soft, if it's going to hurt my hand, how much grog is in it. Like I do this thing where I rub it. You know, I'm asking a question. What is, you know, is this the right state? You know, and so we, we do that in the ground. Like, what is this material? Um, and grab another one. And then pretty soon, like, you have this memory of asking questions that are around you of this kind of imprint of the hand, which becomes kind of like, yeah, that memory, which becomes, what is this? This becomes like tool becomes weapon, you know, becomes this like origin tool, you know, origin. Uh, that's how tools were constructed. You know, all of a sudden it becomes this exploration of like anthropology, you know, that takes you back, you know, way further than, you know, my childhood, you know. Um, there was this point where Eleanor made this kind of like bludgeoned kind of structure, you know, because we were doing, all of a sudden it turned into weapons, you know. And she had these spikes on it, and she, you know, this little seven-year-old, six-year-old, she's just like, Dad, you know, could you imagine, you know? And I saw her wincing side of her face, you know, and and like, and so she was connecting to this kind of like this thing, this root thing that traverses way back, you know, radical. You know, that's knowledge, right? You know, exploration of history just through asking questions of the ground, right? So cool. That's great. I want to make sure that we get some questions from the audience, too, right. if people have questions. Yeah, in the back. Because you stopped, right? Right. And then it's kind of like, who was I previously? Like, I was in it, the hard part was I was in this, I was in there, it was happening as, uh, in, when I was still rendering flowers. And there was this period of time where, like, I had to, I was navigating my space super slowly and I didn't stop, you know? I regretted that. Like, I just kind of, I told myself that I, I, my vision, I had a concussion when I was younger and my vision was blurry. And I was like, oh, my vision's not blurry, I'm fine, you know. Um, and then a few uh, weeks later, I was telling a friend about the concussion and I like tapped the back of my head. And all of a sudden, this, just tapping it, you know, uh, the symptoms came back like 12, 20, like tenfold, you know. And, it, and then it, it took me another two, year and a half or something. And I still struggle with it, you know, because there's this, as you get older, I think the I think the concussions a lot more. Uh, you start to feel, you know, it exists. Sometimes when you sometimes I'm like, oh, don't talk about it, 
you know, because then it then it brings it, you know, if I don't if I don't mention it, you know, I can trick myself to think it's not that it doesn't exist. Um, but uh, I think there was this like it didn't I didn't realize the damage, you know, that took place and the vulnerability that I, that was really happening in my mind, and so. Um, I think I got in this state of, I've been thinking recently of the idea of rather than this state of the vulnerability of as you grow, you know, there's these different states of thinking where rather than on one hand, you could be like this ever evolving gaining of knowledge, you know, as you expand forward in age, you know, you're constantly just opening, becoming more knowledgeable, right? And then there's a state of like things slowly falling apart, you know, collapsing, like sand in your hands, you know, losing, having a thought, finding the meaning of life and then losing it, finding the meaning of life and losing it, you know, this just joy and then just like, no, like, you know, uncertainty, you know. And so I've been trying to figure out how to, I've been, the mind is so powerful. And so in, in finding these conceptual ladders to be able to connect with different states of thinking right that's been my the framework of my what i how, how i use my practice now is to find to stitch together ways of thinking that and find gaps find entry points find um i was thinking about you know the uh wormhole concept you know like uh, time travel you know right you have the piece of paper what's the quickest point between two distances you know you fold the piece of paper over right that's, that's, you know, whatever, time travel, you know. You think that that's just this impossibility, but that's a metaphor, you know. You know, like, and how can you take these two, how can you just connect this thought and all of the burden and struggle just disappear, right? Like, what? it's a radical metaphor that exists without, you know, outside of space within the, that you can use as a, as a device in the mind to whether it be struggling with relationship or communication or you're holding on to something, you know, if you can just like connect these two points that you know that are truths, you know, and all of that stuff, you know, you could let go of it if you want it, you know, and that the idea of that being as a gift of just, uh, yeah, oh my God. So I've been thinking about, I've been using that a lot as a metaphor. I'm sorry, I, I went more than your question. Another question. When you start a project, do you have a pretty good idea of what its the final form will be? Or does it kind of evolve as you work on it? And where in the process do you decide on the color? Right. Color is very well, the color is very end. So and if I and if I think I know, I will be proven wrong. You know? Uh, just the other day when uh, Aaron came to the studio, I an architect came and he's like, flowers don't do that, you know? Flowers aren't multicolored, you know? You know, they, they, one, you know, flower structures, it's all one color and then the stalks, you know? And maybe you'd have different colors of species of that flower. You know, it's like, well, that's not the point, you know? Like, I'm interested in, you know, them as this like re-articulation of form, this growth, this response to my emotional state, kind of longing or navigating a state of my thinking, uh, if, if, you know, I'll be listening to music or listening to the news and navigating or, or thinking about my family or why my, you know, why, why my mother doesn't call me, you know, <laughs> or what, like why I struggle communicating with my mother or my, my dad or something, you know, and, and like that might, that will shift the colors that I think are, that need to go there. Like that color decision is a communication, you know with the state of thinking, me working through my own work, right? That will, like, so that's why the color is this way of like bringing and pulling and getting to a state of thinking that then might emerge from a different vantage point, right? So the color is this exploration. That's why they were multicolored. And it, but, so then he left the studio and I was just like, yeah, like why don't I just, let beauty exist. Like, why don't I isolate these colors that work, that I know are beautiful? Why can't I just, just do these two relationships and put it on one whole form and just celebrate just the radical beauty of this color, you know? 
And so I was so excited. You know, I made all of these glazes, set up these conditions for the colors like to happen. And I go in there and then all of a sudden, like this one was a bluish variation. This one was like uh, red and, uh, no, orange and, what was it, orange and, orange and something. I forget, orange and red. But the red was a fusing kind of crazy color. It was a complicated thing. But all of a sudden they flipped, right? When I go into this, when, the moment I try to make a, put the color on, all of a sudden they flipped colors. So I had to navigate that, you know, like, okay, uh, it shifted. And then I started, I was still convinced that I could put these two colors onto the form. And the, but the moment I started applying color, it, I couldn't, I couldn't, it, it needed to have this gradation of shading started to emerge here. Like I, I, there was language that I haven't resolved yet. There was a way of thinking that I hadn't resolved yet. And so like the moment I, so I, I, every time I get into this moment where I think I know, like I, I'm proven wrong, you know, the, the work, the, I start it and I can't, you know, it, the power of what it longs to be is greater than what I'm trying to impose on the object. So usually I don't think about color until the very end when I'm in this space. Who am I now? You know, what state of thinking am I in now? And how does that take place in the form? Right? Because I'm always proven wrong when I try to like create that, try to tried to kind of impose that language on form and color. Also because like clay, when you're working, it's liquid, it's breathing, it's like alive, there's water, and then it, water disappears and it's a shell of your idea. You know, it's a different thing. And then it fires and it shrinks. And it's, it's a different object. So like the way you, the self engagement is, it's a different engagement, right? You're different, the object's different, and so you kind of have to like find this new, uh, a new dialogue, right? I thought maybe, okay, we have one more question. Let's take one more question. And then I thought it would be nice to end if I saw you have in your slides there the work that's in the collection here at HOMA now. And I thought you could end by talking about that a little bit. But first, let's take this last question. Great. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Right. I think, well, I think the gold leaf was more, it was at a time when I was kind of um, uh, arguing with why I was glazing everything, uh, why I was, this idea, the parameters between painting and sculpting started to collapse, materials started to collapse, you know, so I think my, my mind was open to different, like, surface relationships, right? Um, and trying to, like, I would did these kind of lustered pieces early on where these kind of uh, uh, ceramic luster, and they would, they, in, in kind of wanting to play with different kind of concepts of gold, you know, I think there was this longing of, like, bringing this kind of radiance to this topic, which I think at the time was, like, me, you know, it took me, like, three, our daughter was, pre our second, our daughter, who, uh, my daughter now, she was three months premature. And and I think there was this point where it was like, I kept feeling like, you know, uh, I was working in my graduate program and like we had this, we were pregnant and we ha and then we had this miscarriage, you know, and then, and I was like, uh, I would, oh, I had this whole body of work in LA that I was making for the show. And I was working, I had this deadline, and then all of a sudden, all of the work blew up, you know, in a matter of three days, these giant works crashed and exploded, and it was just like, the moment I kind of was getting to these, like, opportunities, it was taken away from me, you know, and then it happened again, you know, and then again, and then, and then when we, and then my wife had, was like on bed rest the entire pregnancy while I was working for this exhibition, you know, I was like, as hard as I was trying to work, to just, move forward, you know, no matter what I did, it was going to be taken, something was going to be, the moment I, something was going to be like, I was going to step forward, I was like just prepared for things to just be taken away, right? And so like when our daughter was finally born, 
it, I just was waiting, you know, for that, for her to be taken away. And, and it took me like three years. It took three years until I was able to like accept that she was going to stay, you know? And so I think when I was dealing with, with this work, I was looking at this, there was these like massacre innocence paintings of like this violence of like masculinity and, and this kind of like fear. And there's this figure, it's kind of mother and child, but it's like the moment of you kind of recognize it's this kind of male figure that kind of like, because of the history of that, it just kind of complicates the narrative of if it's kind of in a state of mourning or if it's kind of at, at fault of the situation, you know, the narrative flips, right? And just kind of like me dealing with my own kind of like uh, past and contending with that uh, restructuring of my own thinking uh, and role as a caregiver and stuff. And, um, and there was just this kind of desire to kind of like, um, it's, it's kind, of, kind of being gilded. It was just this relevant like topic of my thinking, right? That I needed to kind of honor. Um, I think like knowing your work too, like this work is a real turning point in what you were creating, you know, because you're doing a lot of those works like about childhood or, but they were sort of um, like, not directly connected to you in a way, or right. you it's know, like the, art history. I, I was, yeah. like, I found myself like telling a narrative of like I was a child, and I had the image of me as a baby, you know, and, and that's why I kind of stumbled into clay, and I was working from images and history, and they happened to be kind of child portraiture, and I think I loved them because they were awkward and strange, you know. So I think some of those portraits, I'm not sure where, I'm not sure if I'm butchering this, but like they would like create the landscape and the bodies and then they could maybe, the, the, the patron could have their kids painted into there, right? And so the heads would be a little askew, a little plump, you know, a little disconnected. And I just, there was this admiration for just the, the strangeness and awkwardness in that language that I just, I don't know, I was like drawn to. So that became the subject matter. But then over time, like that child language, like it's, it's, it's not just about childhood, which at first I didn't know why I was working with that language. It's more about just the, just this delight, the kind of exploration of the world, curiosity as just this root between the work and celebration, just like, like, like trying this longing to just be uh, fully alive in the world, right? In, in, in whatever, whatever you do to manifest that for yourself. Like how do you create the parameters in your practice where you're just fully engaged, fully alive in the world, you know, in your body? I think that being the kind of root thing there that tied it together, right? I think that's a really good place to end. Thank you guys. And thank you so much to Matt. We are just incredibly honored thank to have you here, here with us and looking forward to more over the course of this, this year. I appreciate the space to kind of be vulnerable. I think like the, for me, like my work is in a state of kind of like of um, solace, you know, and, and I enter in this space and it's full of everything, you know, it's, it's this fullness, all history that I can engage and step into. It's a stepping into the world, you know, when I'm in that space. And so, like, to be able to share some of the things that I navigate there, it's, I, it's, a, it's a gift to me, and I'm grateful uh, to have this space. So thank you.